Well, welcome to um, Paleopedology. Today, let's talk about paleosols of the Precambrian, which have turned out to be very useful indeed for understanding both the uh, tectonics and the atmosphere of the early Earth. Um, my own special interest in Precambrian paleosols has been life on land in the Precambrian, but I'll save that for the next uh, for the next lecture. The big debate about tectonics, of course, uh, in the Precambrian. Um, has been um, the um, idea of um, whether it was um, uh, plate tectonic or um, the pyrogenic. So um, the, the basic structure of Precambrian areas, uh, like the Pilbara of Western Australia, um, is a structure of big granite plutons. Uh, all the really oldest crustal areas of the world are like this. Uh, big granite plutons. This is a map view now um, with greenstone beds uh, belts uh, running um, between them. So this is granite, and this is greenstone. Greenstone, of course, is um, a highly metamorphosed uh, basalt, um, and um, in cross section, it looks something like this. There's granite, and um, and greenstone. Um, one view of this uh, is that the whole Earth, very early on, had a, a huge um, bombardment, uh, and that created a granitic layer. Um, which was uniform throughout the whole uh, world. Um, and um, the idea then uh, is that that broke up and created rift valleys, like the Canyon um, Rift Valley system, to create this unusual structure in the early Earth. Um, the other idea is that each of these granite domes was part of an island arc. Here's the sea, here's the ocean crust going down like so, uh, and the granites are being generated here uh, from the melting of um, the um, ocean uh, crust. Plate tectonic versus um, a, pyro, uh, a pyrogenic. Now, what can paleosols tell us about this? Well, paleosols have a lot to tell us um, about uh, the um, nature of landscape stability. Uh, because certain sorts of uh, paleosols um, represent very, very stable landscapes over long, long periods of, uh, of time. Uh, let's go back um, about three, uh, two, one, billions of years ago. Now, um, Earth was created uh, sometime around about 4.5 billion years, but we don't know too much about it back then. Uh, these oldest terrains that we have are around about 3.5 um, billion years or so. Uh, so that's really pretty much um, the uh, extent of our fossil record of, uh, of soils. Um, we can then uh, start to draw a kind of a range chart for different kinds of soils uh, throughout um, Earth uh, history. One kind of soil which is very prominent is a green clay um, soil. Um, it's very common uh, to get uh, soils that are well drained and what evidently thick soils developed on bedrock, like granitic bedrock, that is still green. This is unusual. Um, I have even um, proposed that we should call it a veridisol a 13th order of the uh, soil taxonomy, um, but um, that has not been taken up by anybody yet. I doubt that it will be. Um, this would be the prepongal uh, example, about 3.2 billion years old, and this would be the pre-Athabasca example from um, Pongal is in South Africa, in Pomonongama province, uh, the pre athabascan one is in Arctic uh, Canada. Um, so something odd is going on. These green clay paleosols, if we have a thick profile of clay material, 
in the world today, it's usually not green. It's usually quite, uh, quite red. Um, bauxite. <clears throat> Bauxite is a very thick soil product. Um, it's an AL203 um, ore. Um, usually in weathered profiles, deep weathering profiles, and that are four or five um, uh, meters uh, thick. And um, these are um, quite ancient. They go way, way back to almost three billion uh, years. Uh, they're still forming now in tropical uh, regions. Um, the earliest one is the Anzusa uh, profile of, of Pomolongma. Um, karst, paleocarst, a um, deeply uh, fissured uh, limestone uh, deposit. Uh, these go back to about 2.7 billion years um, in Thunder Bay. Um, Ontario. Um, these um, indicate landscapes where the limestone or dollar stone has been uh, deeply weathered and deeply uh, fissured. Um, laterites only go back about two billion years. Uh, this is, of course, an iron ore. Um, it's a kind of a paleosol, um, which is uh, found um, in uh, tropical regions of the world. Um, in, uh, uh, but occasionally made, it made its way north as far north as Oregon in the Middle Miocene, for example. Uh, there's a fairly continuous record of them back to about 2 billion years, um, especially at Mount Tom Price, um, which is uh, in Western Australia. Um, <clears throat> the surprising thing, however, is that calcretes, calcareous deeply weathered profiles, uh, go back only about 1.8 uh, billion years um, in uh, the Mara Formation of um, Arctic uh, Canada, and um, silcretes also only go back this far. Um, in the Pitts Formation of um, Arctic uh, Canada. Um, this is very interesting. Um, we seem to have these deeply weathered profiles very early on, and that's a surprise uh, because um, Stan Shum did a kind of a thought experiment some years ago saying that, well, back in the Precambrian, um, it would seem that it, as soon as a feldspar weathered from a granite, it would be washed away uh, physically. That there'd be an excess of physical erosion over chemical erosion without too much life on the surface. But that's not what we see. What we see is a lot of clay in these paleosols going way, way back um, in time. These are thick clay profiles indicating uh, intense chemical weathering for some parts of the landscape, not an unstable uh, kind of um, an environment. Uh, furthermore, they indicate a high humidity at the source of um, weathering, um, and that's true for laterites as well. And the desert soil association, the calcretes and the silcretes, uh, don't turn up until quite a bit uh, a bit later. Another conundrum, of course, um, is um, gelosols. Um, these are basically ice wedges that indicate paraglacial uh, climate. These go back about 2.9 uh, million years. But they appear to be somewhat episodic. So there are some at 2.9, um, all right. There are some at around about 2.4, uh, three successive uh, horizons of ice wedges there. Uh, there are some at about 700. Um, and um, there are some, again, in the um, Ordovician, 
Permocalviniferous, and of course there are ice wedges forming um, today. Um, this um, one here is called Snowball Earth. A time when Earth very nearly froze over. Uh, these earlier uh, Snowball Earth episodes, episodes are um, also uh, pretty, uh, pretty widespread. Um, the um, Ordovician glaciation was largely in the Sahara region of Africa. The Permian Carboniferous one was very extensive throughout all the Gondwana continents, uh, and the Pleistocene Ice Age was primarily uh, in the Northern Hemisphere with rather large um, ice sheets. So there's a number of sort of conflicting things going on here. Um, ice ages commonly do create drier climates, and yet we don't find concretes uh, going that far back. Um, we seem to have indications of humid, deep weathering here, and yet the silkrets and the calcretes don't go back here. Uh, these thick profiles um, are difficult to form under very frozen conditions, and yet um, here it is, um, relatively uh, frozen uh, conditions uh, that are uh, fairly um, early on in time. So the bottom line seems to be um, that um, these very stable kinds of soils are quite widespread um, in um, our um, in our record um, on on Earth. Um, very peculiar. Uh, this suggests to me that this uh, mechanism of extensive um, vertical uh, tectonics uh, is unlikely to be true. Uh, this one seems more likely to me. Um, I like an explanation. Uh, for this distribution of soils, uh, that we have these areas of stability, granitic crust once formed in this fashion in uh, and around island arcs in Andesitic island chains, uh, remain stable for long periods of, uh, of time to allow the formation of these deep weathering uh, soil uh, profiles in continental um, regions. Uh, what's also happened, of course, uh, is that uh, the Earth started out as a kind of a global archipelago of small islands um, in a largely uh, water planet. Uh, but as these island arcs became larger and larger, as island arcs like the Marianas amalgamated into island arcs more like Indonesia and the Philippines and Japan, uh, and then were added to the continent uh, later, we had more and more um, extensive areas um, of um, continental uh, material. And it, these extensive areas of continental material are probably the explanation for why we got deserts. In a global archipelago of Marianas and Fiji and Hawaiian type islands, um, the world is humid and deeply uh, and deeply weathered. Um, in a area with larger continents like uh, the ancient continent of Rodinia and then eventually Gondwana, and uh, now we're heading toward a greater Laurasia as uh, the plates move further uh, to the north. Um, we have more areas of rain shadow and we have a greater potential to start developing these desert uh, soil um, assemblages. How the snowball formed um, without, without big continents is kind of a trick um, to understand because glaciers are now largely in mountain areas. Um, how you got huge ice sheets marine ice sheets as well as terrestrial ice sheets back at 2.9 and 2.4, um, that's kind of a mystery. Uh, presumably there were some largest continental masses there which were the nuclei uh, for these large ice masses uh, to, in some cases, as in Snowball Earth, this neo-proterozoic one, uh, in some cases to uh, have the greatest extent of ice um, ever um, in Earth uh, history. Um, the other uh, interesting thing about this, and, and this has been the emphasis um, of um, Precambrian paleopedology now for quite a number of, uh, of years, is this appearance of laterites at about 2 billion years or so. Um, in fact, laterites are just one of many different kinds of red beds that appear a little bit earlier than this, around about 2.2, 2.3 billion years ago. Uh, before that, um, we have mainly um, greenish um, clay paleosols and green clay um, bauxites. Um, so um, the um, most interesting contribution that paleosols have made to Precambrian geology has been 
um, to study oxygenation of the atmosphere. So Pallas holes are, of course, at the interface uh, between um, the um, air and um, the earth. And so um, we had an idea for some time now, uh, based on certain peculiar kinds of mineral assemblages, uh, that the early earth, the Precambrian, uh, especially before about 2.4 billion years, was very poorly oxygenated. There was very little oxygen um, in uh, the atmosphere. Um, we've known this uh, because of um, detrital uraninite. Uh, big rounded grains of the uranium mineral uraninite, uh, which are usually found along with much larger grains of quartz uh, in uh, what are placer deposits. Um, the great uranium deposits of the world um, in um, Elliott Lake, Canada, um, in uh, different parts of Western Australia, uh, and of course in the Vodasland of uh, South Africa, are almost all older than 2.4 billion years or so. Um, and they are all formed in what appear to be fluvial deposits with cross beds uh, as placer deposits or uh, in other words, as deposits where the heavy grains have fallen out um, in um, the declining flow of a very energetic uh, stream. Uh, the placer deposits that you may be familiar with, the placer deposits of the California Gold Rush, uh, these were from large streams that drained the Sierra Nevada. They carried gold and other minerals um, and they, they were quite uh, vigorous and rapid. They have to be pretty vigorous because gold is very heavy. But as they lose their velocity going around a bend or hitting uh, flatter ground, they drop the gold out preferentially. Uh, and the gold all drops out at about the same time. It's sorted by weight, pretty much, usually with much larger quartz grains around it. Um, uraninite is a similar heavy, heavy mineral uh, that was um, dropped out by um, ancient streams. Now, why is this re re related to oxygenation? Well, uraninite is a mineral that readily oxidizes uh, to a um, yellow, rusty material that then dissolves in water. So you get this nice radioactive um, water. Evidently, that didn't happen much before about 2.4 billion years because all these big deposits of uraninite placer deposits, which have to have been very shallow. We're talking about a stream now. Uh, the diffusion of oxygen, if there had been oxygen in the air, um, would have been uh, rather easy through that relatively short depth. Um, the uraninite places are telling us that uh, there wasn't much oxygen in the air to rust away the uranium um, in the stream uh, deposit. And so it remained concentrated by uh, fluvial flow uh, from um, all that uh, time ago. Uh, these uh, placer deposits are a very distinctive uh, sort of um, mineral ore. Uh, and then there's banded iron formations. Um, this is a peculiar kind of a rock uh, which has um, iron in it usually hematite uh, and um, the iron uh, bands um, alternate with um, quartz. Uh, it's finely banded, so it's a rock that has nice layers, um, nice red bands of hematite and um, uh, white bands of uh, quartz. Uh, and it, um, it's, it appears to have been um, largely um, from a um, episode of um, rusting of the surface of the earth uh, between about 2.5 and about 1.7 uh, billion years ago. Um, very uh, distinctive kind of formation, which has not been found before, uh, before or after. Although there are some um, examples of banded iron formations that form in, say, crater lakes, for example. Um, and that could have been the explanation for some of the Precambrian ones um, as well. Um, 
it's now thought that some of the iron is um, actually precipitated by iron oxidizing bacteria. And so it has a strong biological component. But um, the idea of having um, this odd um, episode of widespread banded iron formation uh, throughout the world at a particular time in Earth history has also been taken as an indication of a um, transition in the atmospheric oxidation state, which was unique um, in Earth uh, history. Now, the, um, <clears throat> the evidence, of course, um, to decide uh, quantitatively what's going on here is in, uh, is in paleosols. Um, and a number of these paleosols have been studied in detail. Uh, for example, in Elliott Lake, Ontario, Canada, 2.3 billion years ago. Um, Elliott Lake uh, is a famous mining district in Canada for these um, uraniferous uh, conglomerates and sandstones, uh, which is called the Huronian. Uh, it was mined for many, many years um, until the bottom of the uranium market kind of fell out um, for uranium. Um, now it appears to be a retirement community for old folks, um, and uh, the mining camps have been converted into um, old people's um, homes. And um, the uraniferous conglomerate indicates low um, oxygen tensions, and so also um, do the paleosols. Um, this is an unconformity here of the basal, fluvial, uranium, uraniferous uh, conglomerate. And um, there are two kinds of parent material below the unconformity. Uh, one is a greenstone. Uh, with core stones of greenstone like so. Um, with um, um, a thick uh, clay material. Uh, so uh, this is about 10 meters. That's a thick weathered profile. So if you thought um, Precambrian paleosols were thin, well, you'd be wrong about that. Um, this is sericite, which is a metamorphosed kind of clay. Um, and this um, uh, zone with the core stones and a bit of structure uh, is 10 meters thick. It's 60 centimeters. There's more sericite. And at the very top, there is pyrotite, which is a, uh, a kind of a iron uh, sulfide. Um, there is also, uh, in full contact with the greenstone, um, an alkali granite. And this pairing is, is quite interesting. The alkali granite was evidently a deeply weathered profile, although not nearly so deep, only about five meters thick. Um, and um, there is a, um, a kind of a, a altered zone here, about uh, 50 centimeters thick, of uh, iron-rich ferruginous uh, sericite. This one is green sericide. Um, this particular paleosol is called the Denison profile, or the Denison uh, pedotype. Um, after the Denison mine, this one is called the Pronto uh, pedotype. Now, Dick Holland, who was um, quite a big name in this kind of stuff, um, uh, was very taken by the way um, in which two, two paleosols at the same unconformity um, showed um, very strong iron depletion and um, rather minor iron enrichment. Um, and um, he had the idea then that in this profile, uh, which was very rich in iron, it's a greenstone, uh, what was happening was that the iron was being um, weathered by hydrolysis out of the primary minerals and then lost in solution as FeO. Uh, and uh, there was so much iron uh, that it was uh, extensively lost 
In this profile, a granite with rather low iron content, the iron was um, being uh, weathered out rather more slowly. And in that situation, even a limited amount of iron uh, could be oxidized uh, and, um, and uh, be retained in the paleosome. So it's a kind of a, a kinetic model, as it were, uh, for the um, oxygen content of uh, the atmosphere. So he argued that 2.3 billion years ago, oxygen was starting to rise. It was able to oxidize a granite, but not a greenstone. Um, at Cape Roth, um, which is in Scotland, uh, there's another pair of paleosols that are quite similar. Um, this is about 800 million years ago, uh, a bit less than a billion uh, years. Um, and in this case, we are talking about Torridonian uh, conglomerates. Uh, fluvial deposits, uh, red beds. So the fluvial deposits are red now. They have no uraninite um, in them. Uh, and um, here there are two profiles as well. Um, there's one on um, amphibolite dikes. Amphibolite dikes are quite common. Um, in the uh, 2.7 in, in the in the one in the 1.8 billion year old um, intrusions in this area, these are 1.8 uh, GA in age, um, and the profile is only one meter thick. Uh, it's a green sericite, meaning it was a clay that was highly metamorphosed uh, to uh, to sericite, and then there's a very thin purple clay, about a centimeters. On the other side, a uh, rather thicker profile, um, on um, Louisian gneiss. Um, this gneiss is about 2.7 uh, billion years old. Again, we have core stones. Oh, there's core stones here too. Um, indicating it was a deeply weathered profile. Uh, this is the soil creep that I talked about um, in a past uh, in a past lecture, um, and the surface now thirty centimeters red uh, claystone. Um, there's three meters here of green sericite. Um, this profile here is called the um, the Starker profile, Starker pedotype, and this one here is called the Shegra pedotype. Uh, two distinctly different soils forming on the same landscape at about the same time, uh, and yet uh, this one is clearly more oxidized. Even this one is more oxidized than this. It's not pyrotite and pyrite anymore. Um, it's uh, got a thin purple uh, claystone. This one has 30 centimeters of oxidation. In, in other words, it's a relatively, um, a relatively um, oxidized uh, soil. So the transition from an anoxic to a, um, an oxidized atmosphere occurred uh, sometime um, between about 2.3 and, um, and 1 billion. Years now, um, the way Dick Holland um, saw it, um, the um, we can we can we can look at the um, what is the parent rock compositional reducing power. Um, this is the amount of reduced elements that it has. Um, uh, this is primarily. Uh, reduced iron and manganese, uh, the two most common um, oxidizable um, elements in moles per kilogram, 0.14, this is 1, 0.5 uh, is here. Back in time, 3, 2, 1, 
zero. And um, the, the approach that Dick Holland took was to take pairs of um, soils that have either lost or gained um, in, um, in iron. Uh, so there's two situations, lost iron, um, like um, the, um, the, the, the Denison profile, or gained iron. Um, and he started to look at a lot of different soils of different ages, uh, some in South Africa like this, uh, that had actually gained iron, um, and, um, and some that had lost iron um, here. And what he saw was that there was a kind of a ramping up that looked like this. This is the redox threshold. Uh, for uh, soils, uh, basically, uh, through uh, through time, um, this um, enabled him to actually put constraints on um, the amount of um, iron, amount of oxygen, uh, in the in the atmosphere. Uh, let me remind you then that the um, that the distribution of um, uraninite places was something like this. If this is the abundance. Uh, these are the uraninite places, and the distribution of band and iron formation is something like this. This is the BIF band and iron formation. Something's going on here. Um, oxygen is actually um, rising um, in the in the atmosphere. Now, since um, Dick Holland's initial kinetic study, um, we've actually figured out a way uh, to constrain things uh, and also to develop some sort of theoretical um, expectations um, of um, oxidation and of um, carbon dioxide levels as well. We can calculate both uh, from, uh, from paleosols. So if we want to look at O2 uh, partial pressure in bars, uh, or in um, what we commonly like to do is PAL. PAL um, is the um, partial pressure of oxygen um, in um, times present atmospheric level. Um, this is a bit of a misnomer, present. We mean pre-industrial, generally speaking. Um, and so we, we, can, we can regard the oxygen level as multiples of um, the, the um, pre-industrial um, level. Um, oxygen content is declining very slightly, not particularly measurably. Um, we're going to do a log scale here. Uh, this would be 10 to the minus 1, uh, 10 to the minus 2. So this is a tenth, this is a hundredth, this is a thousandth. 10 to the minus uh, 4. Uh, if we start plotting paleosols now uh, based on their uh, molar consumption of iron and, uh, and manganese, um, we start to get um, a pattern which looks somewhat like this. Oh, we're going three, two, one, zero. This is billions of years before present. We can actually calculate. We also have some bounds. This is uh, Dick Holland's approach. Um, some bounds where uh, this one is actually greater than the value. Um, this one is uh, less than the value. Um, this one is less than the value, uh, less than the value. Um, one limitation of uh, Dick Holland's approach uh, is that you need a very high parametrial composition or power uh, to determine uh, levels that are close to the modern um, atmospheric, uh, atmospheric level. Um, there's clearly something rather profound um, going on um, at around about um, this level here, at around about 2.4 billion years. Actually, it's about 2.43 um, is when the first oxidized paleosol um, really uh, turns up. So a general curve now for um, oxygenation uh, looks something like this. Um, and it's kind of unconstrained uh, from here on out, but we know at some point we got, we got to, about, uh, to about one. Actually, it goes more like this. Um, this is what we call the, the great oxidation event. Uh, 
Um, there appears to have been a bit of a rise uh, sometime in, in, the, in the near proto-rosaic. I'm still uh, trying to work that out. But there are um, theoretical constraints as well uh, to, this, uh, to this rise. Um, it seems to have been quite rapid. Um, it appears to have a kind of a, a bipolar distribution. The Palaisol um, estimates are all a little bit higher uh, than um, based this this estimate um, based on um, mass independent fractionation of sulfur, um, and there are several uh, possible reasons uh, for that. I think some of these mass independent um, estimates from sulfur are based on volcanic. Um, eruptions that went way up into the stratosphere. It's based on the preservation of a stratospheric uh, signal. Um, these others are based on the degree of oxidation of um, red beds and other oceanographic indications of um, oxygenation. Um, we actually have, um, uh, we need more data here obviously to try and fill in this um, but the idea of the great oxidation event at about 2.4 as originally proposed by Dick Holland is uh, now regarded as pretty sound. Um, we can also calculate um, from paleosols now the um, CO2 in bars. Um, oh, let me put a scale here. Um, yeah, one is about here, and then it goes down like so. Uh, one tenth of the minus one. Uh, CO2 in bars, this is, this is one. Uh, one bar, that would be an awful lot because CO2 is a minor component of the atmosphere. 10 to the minus 2, uh, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, or so. Um, and then this is um, CO2 in, um, in PAL, in present atmospheric uh, level. Uh, so um, the present atmospheric level of CO2 is 10 to the minus 3, so there's uh, 1, uh, here's 10, uh, 100, uh, and 1,000. So uh, once again, we've got a scale from uh, 3 to 1, 3 to 1 billion years uh, before, uh, before present. Now, um, my, my student Nathan Sheldon, has devised a way of calculating from the consumption of acid soluble bases, and they would be um, magnesium, calcium, uh, sodium, and potassium. Uh, we can uh, relate the loss of each mole of those to um, a mole of carbonic acid, uh, and um, we can calculate the amount of CO2 that it would have taken to produce that degree of uh, depletion. Um, in the um, in the paleosol over the period of time uh, during which it formed, and he found a very interesting relationship um, indeed. Uh, the big error bars on these data um, for uh, for paleosols. Now, um, this turned out to be really interesting uh, because uh, we have a prediction of how much uh, oxygen we need um, from um, the greenhouse effect um, because the sun has become brighter and brighter uh, through time. And therefore, um, it would have been chilly in the early Earth um, and we needed a higher greenhouse uh, event, uh, effect uh, to actually uh, create um, the warming that we see. Um, and uh, from calculations of this sort, uh, done by Bob Berner and by Jim Casting, we have an envelope like this. This is how much CO2 is theoretically uh, needed um, for um, the early Earth. Um, the, um, I've started running uh, calculations um, here of CO2 using the same sort of paleosol method. And um, this is data not yet published, but it's turning out to be somewhere in the same in the same range, in the same theoretical range. What's rather striking is that this theoretical expectation for the greenhouse effect needed due to CO2 is not met by the paleosols going back in the record um, to 
um, about uh, 3 billion years or so. What that means, I think, is that um, in order to maintain um, surface water at the surface of the planet, um, we need to have had some other greenhouse gases. Uh, methane is a, would be a good example, um, uh, and perhaps there are, there are others. Um, that, um, these other greenhouse gases, there could have been a methane haze um, on the early uh, Earth, which made it uh, habitable. Uh, this was kind of a surprising result that uh, CO2 is relatively um, relatively low, particularly as we go further back um, in, uh, in the record uh, itself. Uh, very uh, peculiar uh, situation. Now, um, I've been puzzled about this for some time. It looks like Pallas also going to be the answer eventually to giving us a quantitative view um, on the evolution of the atmosphere uh, through uh, geological time. Um, however, uh, why uh, is CO2 uh, running out um, in the early um, Earth? Um, it, it seems that the greenhouse, it's not going to give you the greenhouse effect that you need um, in order to keep the world uh, in a habitable uh, temperature. Well, it turns out um, that there's something else really interesting that's been discovered about Precambrian palisols in recent years, and that is the prevalence of acid sulfate weathering. Um, many um, of the Precambrian um, paleosols uh, have um, a BY horizon uh, that has um, desert rose uh, sand crystals. Uh, for example, here's a paleosol uh, from uh, the Pilbara. Uh, it's the, the dual pedotype. at uh, 3.5 uh, billion uh, years um, of um, age. Um, it's a, a, a profile that looks something like this. It's very clay and silty and sandy. Um, and it's got um, a rather carbonaceous top to it. Uh, this is sand. This is sand down in here. And then in this zone here are um, sand crystals of barite. So this is an A. B, Y, C profile, not very thick, about 40 centimeters or so. Um, these are sand crystals of barite. Barite is barium sulfate. Um, a, um, a, a, a mineral that's quite rare in soils uh, today. Uh, it's a sand crystal or a desert rose because you can see it's a barite crystal and yet inside it there are all the grains of the soil um, itself. Now when a barite crystal forms in the ocean or in um, waterlogged uh, sediments, um, the forces of crystallization of the crystal uh, make a limpid crystal or a clear crystal. They force the um, material um, out uh, from the area of the crystal uh, itself. These are desert roses and they're found characteristically in desert soils uh, and in uh, plier deposits. Um, here's another one, uh, another profile from um, the um, Pilbara. Uh, this one is only um, about um, 3 billion years old, the carry uh, pedotype. Um, and once again, it's, it's under sand, um, and then there's sand below it as well, uh, but it's a rather uh, thick profile of, of about 40 centimeters again. Um, profiles are not in incredibly thick at that time. Um, there's an organic surface, which is an A. Um, there's a BY uh, and, a, and a C horizon. The bedding comes in here. Uh, there are these long crystals here, long pseudo hexagonal uh, crystals, and then there are some of barite. Uh, in this BY horizon, we have barite. 
which is the barium sulfate mineral, plus an alkali. Um, which is in a HCO3. A, a sodium uh, bicarbonate uh, mineral. Uh, this is another mineral that we find in alkali lakes and in, um, in gypsum type uh, desert soils. These are gypsum type desert soils. This one actually has constraints on the amount of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and um, remarkably um, the estimate for 3 billion years that we get from a narcolite in a paleosol uh, is pretty similar to the estimate that we got from um, the mass balance approach that Nathan uh, Sheldon um, used. My point is that there's something else going on in these uh, in these soils. Uh, these are acid sulfate weathering uh, soils. Um, they are created um, by um, sulfur oxidizing bacteria. Um, these are sulfur cyclers. Um, carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is recycled by cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are um, oxygen cyclers and um, carbon cyclers. Um, they take in carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen uh, like plants uh, like plants do. Uh, it could be that this explains the discrepancy um, between the, um, the, the, the way in which um, the CO2 uh, estimate from palisols is dropping off. It could be that some of the principal uh, soil forming bacteria when we get back into the Archean were actually uh, sulfate um, cycling bacteria rather than uh, cyanobacteria. Uh, and then, of course, the other um, the other uh, component, of course, are methanogens. Uh, which uh, make methane. Methanogen just means uh, makes methane. Uh, these are bacteria in the soil that make a methane-rich atmosphere um, and therefore um, enable um, the um, habitable world with a relatively lower amount of CO2 than would be expected from simple greenhouse uh, models. So um, what it's converging on um, is that uh, maybe even in the Precambrian, um, the atmosphere was controlled um, by soil microbes, by a change in the soil microbiome. That the simple um, physical chemical models that we've used to estimate uh, atmospheric composition from paleosols may be a little bit too naive, that there's a very strong component of um, a soil microbiome influence on the atmosphere. We have always thought that cyanobacteria were responsible for the great oxidation event, by the way. Uh, that's what makes Earth unique. It has cyanobacteria. Um, it has uh, plants also later that have the unique ability to create oxygen out of carbon dioxide. Um, this is why most other planetary bodies have carbon dioxide uh, coming out of volcanoes and out of the other degassing springs, other uh, sources of carbon uh, dioxide, uh, whereas Earth is unique in having an oxygenated atmosphere. As much as 21% of our atmosphere is now, uh, is now oxygen, and carbon dioxide is a very minor component, um, even though um, last week it was 421 ppm, uh, which is a big advance over 280 ppm uh, for the pre-industrial level of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. It would seem then um, that um, life in soil, uh, which of course is closest to um, the nutrition of the world, um, taking phosphorus and other elements by weathering, uh, life in soil may have had a very strong um, influence on the evolution of the atmosphere and particularly big events like the Great Oxidation Event uh, of 2.4 billion years ago uh, and subsequent oxidation uh, created by the evolution of larger uh, photosynthetic organisms uh, such as lichens 
and, uh, and plants. I think we're at a very interesting point in the study of paleosols and in the early earth where we can start to see these um, linkages and how important they were uh, to the evolution of um, our world as we know it uh, now. Well, that'll do for the moment. Next time I'll go more and more uh, into um, the evidence for life in Precambrian paleosols and perhaps even of the origin of life in paleosols. So thanks for your attention.